Welcome. I'm just going to do this little presentation on the theology of a Samaritan woman meeting Jesus at Jacob's Well, a conversation that we find in John chapter 4. A very, very interesting conversation. I began by writing a homily and trying to dig into it. That kind of forms the basis of the presentation as I tried to uncover uh, what was going on with that that encounter because it's, it's, it's really puzzling in some ways. Hey, we know it's a it's a, it's a very well known story. We all probably can know it that Jesus is is traveling up through Samaria. He stops because he's tired at this well. He meets this woman that's there at a uh, odd time of day. He asks for water. Ensuing conversation about living water, husbands, Jacob, greater than Jacob, and all this kind of stuff goes on. <clears throat> Finally, she runs off and and she declares that. Uh, uh, Jesus is the savior of the world and witnesses it to her town and her townspeople. Some listen to her, but they, they run out and they come to see uh, what's going on. One of the common things to talk about with this is that the woman was uh, not well liked, that she had five husbands, that she's there at the wrong time of day, she's not with other women. So, you know, maybe she's uh, not so well up on the social scale. This is interesting, but there's um, some interesting problems that come that arise with this. I'd like to sort of sort of outline some of them. Well, one of the big issues is that uh, she's an outcast. This is this is just sort of assumed because of the time of day and because of five husbands. I don't know if this is necessarily true, but it's a problem with this. Why would people listen to an outcast, woman or not? Like. Uh, why would she believe, why would they even take the time of day to run up and who sees this Jesus is if she's such a slow estate? Another issue, the question is, why does John devote so much time to this encounter? Well, he does. It's it's one of the longer conversations that, he, that Jesus has. Uh, is there a significance in this location uh, and the situation, situation around him? surrounding it. I mean, John is very careful to tell us where Jacob's well is, near the field of Jacob, near J where, sorry, near Joseph's bones. So Jacob's field, Joseph's bones. This is, this is a central uh, hub of history. And why a Samaritan woman? Why a woman at all, really? There's just some other things. It just this, this sort of Digging around here, so let's let's just have another look at it. Well, and the thing is, we look at it. My purpose is not to be exhaustive, but to rather point to other themes and a bigger a bigger picture of what what's going on. I don't have time here to do exhaustive search, but I'm just going to point out some things and and try to bring it together. We need to look at the location. We need to look at who the Samaritans were. We need to look a little bit at the dialogue and see how all this comes together in a way that, that is helpful and, and brings some light to the situation and hopefully encourages you to do your own research and to carry on forward uh, with this. <clears throat> so where is it? It's in a historic place. It's near Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim is situated south of the modern city of Nablus, well, actually near Shechem. And it's about 30 kilometers north of Jerusalem, so not that far from Jerusalem. Uh, 40 kilometers east of the Mediterranean, so it's not too far inland. Um, it's got Mount Ebal to the north, Mount Z Gerizim overlooks this valley as well, so they're kind of opposite each other. Um, one of the things to note is the main road from Jerusalem going north goes through this area. So it's not surprising Jesus found himself there. The geography all lines up with the story. But the story is is situated right here. It's a very important place. This is where it's done. Just to get an idea of what it looks like, I've included this picture. We have Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, so they are opposite each other. And then we have, uh, you know, Shechem, Nablus, Sikar, maybe in this whole area here. So it's all very close together. This is not a huge distance, is it, really? So what about the history? 
what are some of the markers that we can we can kind of see uh, what's going on near Shechem between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal? So we hear that Jacob purchases land at Shechem and sets up an altar there in Genesis 33. In Genesis 48, he gives to Joseph this land that he's purchased near Shechem. And uh, that's this plot of ground that he gives to him that he bought from the Canaanites. We know Joshua's bones are buried here from uh, Joshua 24. <clears throat> we know that when Joshua comes into the land, it's here between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim that he does a covenanting ceremony. It's very important, Joshua 8. Um, and he's to do curses for Mount Ebal and blessings for Mount Gerizim. This is really central. And of course, um, recently in archaeology, they have found a curse tablet uh, in the location of the uh, temple, if you could say, on Mount uh, Mount Ebal, which, which is a tablet of curses that they've roughly dated it to the time of Joshua, which is really quite fascinating. I could talk about why, why Mount uh, Gerizim was blessings and why Mount Ebal was curses. One of the suggestions um, is that Mount Gerizim is surrounded by springs of water and Mount Ebal isn't. This is an interesting way to look at it. We know in this location that God gave the land to Abraham near Shechem in Genesis 12, 6, and 7. And then Abraham built an altar here. And this is in the context of the whole Genesis 12 at the beginning where jo where God says to Abraham that, that he calls Abraham to, to have land, to have offspring, and to be a blessing to the nations. And at this moment, a few verses further on, here at Shechem, God says to Abraham, this is the land, this is the land. Here, this is the land. And it's part of that whole um, promise that God made to Abraham, a promise, by the way, that was unconditional. So here at this place, we have Joshua, we have Abraham, we have Jacob, we have land, we have covenants, we have altars, we have the core beginnings of Israel are found in this place, a place pregnant with history, hope, and promise. This place, Jesus meets a woman at a well. So we've established that this place is important, that Jesus is going to make a point here. So, from 1 Kings, we have the recounting of the deportation of the northern kingdom to Babylon. And then, uh, just to keep in mind that when we're dealing with, with, with the Samaritans, we're really dealing with the northern kingdom. And I'll probably be say that a few times. Northern kingdom versus the southern, southern kingdom of Judah. These, these are not suddenly the Samaritans were enemies or the north was enemies. This is something that, that uh, is a development uh, in, in this area between Judeans and Israelites. So the northern kingdom was taken off into into Babylon, and eventually they were replaced with people. Um, we have Josephus' accounts of the Samaritans. <laughs> Josephus does not like the Samaritans, just FYI. And you can, you can read through his books, but here's a, a quote I came up with just as a sample <clears throat> where he's not saying good things about the Samaritans. The Samaritans, being evil and enviously disposed to the Jews, wrought them many mischiefs by reliance on their riches and by pretense that they were allied to the Persians on account that thence they came. And whatsoever it was that they were enjoined to pay the Jews by the king's order out of their tributes for the sacrifices, they would not pay it. Well, okay, <clears throat> not, not, not really upstanding people. So from this, you, you get the idea that there's, there's this tension that exists between Samaritans and Jews. Whatever Josephus', Josephus is, I think, rather biased account may tell us, one of the things is clear is that there is some friction here. And uh, uh, so let's sort of keep that in mind. As we look into the study of the Samaritans, and I was reading about it, some interesting things uh, are beginning to come out of our modern study so that the landscape is is shifting and suggesting that the Samaritan Yahwehism, because they this was their their god they were part of Jacob's family uh, it's not a late arrival to the region but that it grew up organically uh, that the replacement with the foreigners wasn't as complete maybe as some think particularly Josephus but there grew up here a form of of Yahwehism 
which enjoyed a long tradition in its own tradition and, and draws a, a continuous line from the former northern kingdom. So it's not a complete break. There is a continuous line of formation from the northern kingdom that they were part of the family of Jacob. <clears throat> so again, uh, I take this quote here. All the evidence shows that the Samaritans are not a sect that broke off from Judaism, but rather a branch of Yahwehistic Israel in the same sense as the Jews. This is huge. This understanding that, that well, there are two groups of people and they're at odds with each other and whatever kind of thing is going on here. The Samaritans, and we'll see this more, the Samaritans consider themselves Israelites. And there's other evidence that even the Jews, that there wasn't this, that, that there was some recognition. But anyway, this is uh, the main point here. So, so what we're getting essentially is the background the development of the Samaritans is, is complex. Uh, that the new studies are shifting our understanding of the Samaritans more towards being a branch of Judaism. They developed their own scripture and tradition separately from the Jews, and it was based on the Pentateuch. And that these traditions are a development from a common history and received text rooted in the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph. So they, there are people who rely on the Pentateuch, there are people who see themselves intimately related to Abraham, to Isaac, to Isaac, to Jacob, to, to Joseph, and to that whole um, historical rootedness that we find centered here on Jacob's well. Now, just to go a little bit deeper, they did have this, the Pentateuch, but they had their own development of it. So the Samaritans are not Jewish. They're to be distinguished from the Jews, but they are a Jewish sect, but one which nonetheless retains its own distinctive theologies and practices. Well, I don't know. I thought about that, and, and maybe a, a modern uh, analogy would be to take, generally speaking, Protestants and Catholics. I know it's a big can of worms, but, you know, we have the same the same. Bible, except that there's some additions that the Catholics have, and there's some some animosity between the groups sometimes, and, and misunderstandings, and so you know, yeah. So there's this happens because both are Christian, both follow Jesus as Lord, and yet nonetheless uh, there's some tension. Let's put it that way. Oh. Also going on, the Samaritans adhered strictly to the Pentateuch. That is, they didn't have all of the other books that the Jews have or the rabbinic traditions. So they had no juridical exclusion of women as witnesses. It's not done in the Pentateuch, and we'll see that in a minute. It is quite possible that women were competent to witness in that group in many circumstances, whereas Jews, Jewish women were excluded as witnesses by rabbinic code, mostly, but not always. So if you look at the, the, the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 31.12, specifies that women, children, and resident aliens were to be present with the men. This is important because there's no, this is the root for the Samaritans. There isn't some other um, scripture or other interpretations to detract from that. This would be taken by them as important, that the women were part of that group, grouping, and that we have other evidence as well that the women are accepted as witnesses in their own community. So that when we're reading through this and, and, and seeing this woman and Jesus dialoguing with the woman, her attitude as a woman uh, would be different as a Samaritan woman from, say, a Jewish woman and dialoguing with Jesus. So what about the relationship with the Jews? Well. The northern and the southern kingdoms have always been kind of at odds. Um, when uh, David united the kingdoms, and then under Rehoboam, they're divided, and then David sets up Jerusalem as the cultic center, and the northern kingdom doesn't have Jerusalem, so you can't be a king of a country and have the cultic center somewhere else. Um, so the kings of the north uh, set up their own cultic centers and so on and so forth, and, and there's, there's animosity. You can see this from the reading of scriptures between them. Uh, all of this is going on, and then they're taken on to exile, and then 
uh, but not all of them. And, and so there's a developing uh, Israeli, uh, Israelite kind of community there that's isolated from, from the, the southern. So we can see in the, and so as they're being conquered by different peoples in the Persian period and Samaria and Judah uh, were separate provinces, not in direct competition for the religions, as Hensel points out. So we've got two different groupings that are in their own integrity of each other. So they're doing their own thing. They're not interacting as much uh, in, a, in a negative kind of way. But later on under the Greeks, the Ptolemies, they were combined into one province and this caused a lot more problems, a lot more tension, a lot more, you know, um, competition for worship and all that kind of stuff. So this, this causes a little more churning of the waters, as we should say. And then I a quote here, because the sanctuaries, like any other sanctuary in ancient times, not only served as a place of cultic practice, but also enjoyed various privileges, such as tax exemptions and other financial concessions that went along with the running of the temple, it is possible that a competitive environment existed here. So there's taxing, there's tourism, if we could put it that way, there's all this stuff and it's causing a ferment, there's um, the fact that the Samaritans didn't have the full uh, understanding of scriptures that the that the, the Judeans have, and so this, this causes a lot of tension. Uh, going forward. But archaeology nevertheless is discovering that the Samaritans did actually consider themselves as Israelites. One of many examples are inscriptions found on the island of Delos. And these this, these inscriptions, uh, in these descriptions, uh, the community there terms themselves Israelites and they look to Mount Gerizim. This is important. And this is the earliest attestation to the name of the Samaritans as well. So we have this idea that a group of the Samaritans looking to Mount uh, Gerizim, calling themselves Israelites. And then of course we have the development of the building of the temple on Mount Gerizim. Again, centralizing worship and then the, the Temple of Jerusalem, the Temple of Mount Gerizim, and then the Temple of Mount Gerizim is destroyed by the Hasmoneans. Again, with this, so this, which is, you know, when somebody tears your church down, it does not endear you to them. Just saying. So some of these things that are going on, you can see people ha in their integrity of themselves in, in trying to be faithful to what their understanding of their scripture and, and, and of, again, Yahwehism, of Yahweh worship, of, of being Israelites, uh, people of the family of Jacob, developing differently in different places. Well, the key point I want to make here is the observation that the testimony of the Samaritan woman would have been accepted. So this is not an anomalous. This is something that, that was in, endemic to their culture. And that the Samaritans were, I mean, I think they were Israelites, but certainly in their own eyes, they were Israelites. They considered themselves part of this family of Jacob, as is seen uh, by the woman referring to our father Abraham. So, now we get to the wells. What are the wells? What's going on here? Well, let's just take a step back and look at Scripture. In, in the scripture, we have Isaac and Rebekah at well, Genesis 24. Jacob and Rachel, Genesis 29. Moses and Zipporah, Exodus 2. All of these are, are fundamental uh, uh, encounters and marriages that are critical to the expansion and the growth of the family of Israel. So we have this setting of, of wells and of meetings at wells between men and women. And Jesus is there, and she, he, 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 he starts talking to her, and he requests water, which, in a particular phrase, which I think is on my next slide. Jesus' request for water causes considerable suspicion on the part of the woman, um, because such requests at wells are deep in the tradition. She says, okay, he's asking me, and he's asking me in terms that I understand from the tradition. So right from the get-go, we are getting a kind of theological discussion. And also notice that the issue is not that she was a woman, but rather that she was a Samaritan. She says as much, and she calls Jesus out on it. What are you doing? Why are you calling me? I'm getting suspicious. And she calls, why would you, a Jew, talk to me, a Samaritan? Hmm. Not a woman, but a, like a Samaritan. 
what are you doing, Jesus? Because I know this is about the bringing together of families. I know that these meetings at Wells have got to be, do with marriages. How are you going to bring about that, Jesus? We're, I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew. Ha! Yeah. So, what what following is a Semitic theological encounter, not a Greek theological encounter. By that I mean um, that that in the, our Greek theology is, is didactic, A, B, C, D. Rather, the Semitic is more in terms of story and encounter. So keep that in mind. We Also, we look at uh, when we talk about the, the Jesus wording, remember I said uh, there is a Abraham's servant, uh, Abraham's servant to Rebekah in, uh, in the scripture. You get, uh, then the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me sip a little of your water jar, from your water jar. Now this is interesting. So she knows all this stuff. The underlying theme is marriage. Jesus' response to the offer of life-giving water uh, is Jesus' response, sorry, the underlying theme is marriage. And Jesus' response to her kind of questioning is to offer her life-giving water that satisfies forever. So the woman is puzzled and suspicious. How can Samaritans and Jews be together? Because this is a marriage context. Her response of how can you do this without the right tools? So how can you get the water? So, okay, how are you going to do this, Jesus? What's going on here? And then part of that response is also, okay, so you're going to be giving us, does that mean you're greater than our father, Jacob? Again, our father, Jacob. Not, not the Jews' father, our father, Jacob, who gave us this well. And then, then Jesus is then moving into the language of gift. Jesus is saying, I'm, it's a gift of God. The gift of living water to eternal life is more excellent. And so Jesus is therefore greater than Jacob. I, that, that's an interesting dialogue there. And then it calls to mind the dialogue of that Jesus is greater than our father Abraham in John 8. Or Jesus saying something greater than the temple is here. Oh, this is this is push push. Like what's going on? And again, Jesus' response is shifts shifts the uh, the focus from this water to who gives the water. If you knew, it talks about the gift who was give, offering you this gift of God. If you knew who this was, okay. There's there's um, emphasis now on Jesus, not just the water. Um, and the who in verse 10 here is linked to the gift of God. Because the gift of God, Jesus in his person is offering, in his person, is offering the gift of God. And by definition, such a gift satisfies as completely the receiver of that gift. The gift of God is wholeness and goodness and life. And Jesus then states that the gift he gives is life and does not and does satisfy. And again, remember that in the midst of this talking about life and and uh, the gifts, the greatest gift, of course, is what? Torah. And what does Torah do? It brings life. For example, Psalm 1. The living waters. Planted beside living waters, which is the Torah, the tree will blossom. She accepts this to, to some point. And then she says, but again, talking about Jacob, her, her response is, uh, to Jacob's well so that I do not have to come here. Again, this, okay, you're telling me all of these things, so give it to me so that I don't have to come here. What's here? What's going on with that? Okay. Marriage, water, life, gift, Torah are at the heart of this conversation. You can see it, the ins and outs and the ebb and flow, I uh, hope, of what's, what's happening here. So is it that it's and it's occurring on this deeply rooted historical location. Again, this is how Semitic theology is done. Rooted, it's rooted in time and place, story and dialogue, parable and plot twist. Think of Jesus' his whole ministry, talks and parables, and by symbolic actions. So the woman knows she's in a profound theological dialogue. She can pick that up. And Jesus responds to the question of are you greater? by reaffirming that he brings the water of life, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So his answer is there. There it is. Clear. 
And then we can think about, as we read it, claim that Jesus also made this claim, for example, at the Feast of Tabernacles on the last day of the feast. That's interesting. At the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day of the feast, the water is gone. It's the end of the season. They're looking forward to the early rains, to the crop, uh, the restoring of the crop, and to the filling of the cisterns. Water is central to that. So again, it's the theology is embedded in the location, is embedded in the situation, and then what, how Jesus takes that and then and then and and makes a claim in the middle of that situation. So here Jesus is at a well, a Jacob's well, and he's making a claim about being the water of life, which is tied to this history, which is tied to the Torah. Oh. And then in the midst of this conversation which is embedded in uh, the f foundational marriages of Israel, huh. Jesus brings up the topic of husbands. So it's not off topic. He's not just changing the topic. He's, this, this, this is all bound together. Um, it's been suggested uh, that, and from mostly Josephus' work, Antiquities, is suggesting that there were, there were five idols inherent in the Sumerians, and that maybe these five husbands were Jesus referring to um, the five idols of the Samaritans, something like that. Whatever it is going on here, there's something important happening here. Jesus affirming that he is the, the, gift, the gift giver, affirming that the gift giver is the gift, and that Jesus is the true husband, not just of the Jews, but of the Samaritans. And more work needs to be done around this whole thing, but you're beginning to see some glimmering, some some focusing on what's going on here. Because the woman's response to this is quite important. She calls Jesus a prophet. So she's understanding, I think, the, the theological nature of this, this conversation. And so she sees that Jesus is a prophet. He's made some promises to do with Torah and life. Okay, Jesus, I have a question for you. Who worships God in the right place? Who are the real Israelites, Jesus? That's interesting. Jesus blows you away with his answers. He always blows away with his answers because he affirms both Jerusalem's place and the Samaritan's identity as Israelites. And this is, this is critical. He basically says, look, the Jews worship in the right place, and they know what they're worshiping. However, a time is coming when Jews and Samaritans will worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus has taken this division and thrown it away. He's basically taken the Jews and the Samaritans in his answer and brought them together as one people again. Like It's like you, you read it and go like, what's he just done? He's saying that Jews and Samaritans will worship together, that the family of Joseph, of Jacob, will be brought together. This is amazing, because there is a wedding here. This wedding theme, Jesus is leading it somewhere. The wedding theme alluded to at the opening question and dialogue is now manifest in this Jesus, who is bringing together these disparate people. He's wedding them together. Jesus has united the northern kingdom of Samaria with the southern kingdom of Judah. The two are now one. The gift of God that Jesus brings unites Jacob's family. He unites Jacob's family. Jesus is a true king and prophet like David. I see, sir, that you are a prophet, but he is a prophet like David, and he's a true king, the true king that unites Israel. Because Israel is now united as a kingdom of priests, God's holy nations, in spirit and truth. And so she, she takes this in. She realizes what, what Jesus has done and who he is. And she proclaims Jesus as a savior, not just of Israel, but of the whole world. Because it's coming together. It's coming together. Jesus is healing the divisions. So that we can see that God's promise to Abraham to have the land, a blessing to the nations that was associated with this place is now finding its fulfillment in this place. The word launches forth into the world. This woman carries forth the proclamation from 
this place to her people and forth into the world that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the gift of God, the spring of water that leads to eternal life. Jesus in the Samaritan, in the Samaritans and the Judeans is the fullness of the Torah as living water. So this is who, in Jesus, this is what is happening. He is the for, fullness of the Torah. He's the living water. The, the word made flesh, as John so aptly uh, begins in his gospel. So this Jesus is pulling together. Creation is coming together. The north and the south are united. The world's salvation launches from here. The people of God are united. Jacob's family is together. And together, Jacob's family launches into the world to proclaim this Jesus. Jesus' command is to go from Judea, Samaria, and to all the world. That's in Acts 1. Earlier, I think, in Matthew, he talks about starting, not to these people, but starting in, in Jerusalem. But here now, we begin this opening up. He's united and welded together Judah and Samaria, and now into the world. That's Acts 1. And you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. See the sequence, Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And so we see the scattering of Genesis 11 is reversing. Jews and Samaritans, all Israel are united, bringing the world back together in the living water, the fullness of the Torah, Jesus. And this, this gift, the gift of God, this gift satisfies fully. John's gospel is about a new creation, and so is this dialogue with this woman. There's so much here. Um, I've just sort of scratched at the surface, and I'm sure there's lots of questions and there's lots of connections that I didn't make that need to be made, but I wanted to really sort of step back, sort of show that this is, this is a uh, Jesus meeting this woman. It's a kind of a wedding context. It's a bringing together context. It's a joining together context. And then this woman has in, has her own integrity as a, as a Samaritan. Her witness is accepted. Uh, I don't think she was uh, an outcast, uh, more like a leader because she's, she's received by the community um, as somebody with integrity and as somebody whose witness is, is acceptable and who they re can receive. And then, then she proclaims this gift, this excitement that this Jesus has taken them and made them part of their family again. That, and that's so important to be part of your family, to say, this Jesus is Jew, says we're part of the family, we're, we are Israelites. And, this is, and he is a prophet, and he is he bringing the world together. That's how I see it. I hope it's been helpful. I hope it hopes, helps you to sort of hey, want to dig in deeper and try to see uh, if this is true and how we can unpack this in a way that's exciting because John's gospel as a whole is exciting because John's gospel is about creation. So we'll get into that. But that's that whole thing is here, and I can see this this dynamic of this of this deeply theological discussion and this woman who deeply understands what kind of discussion she's in. Then who is this woman? Uh, she she waltzes into the gospel, and she has this amazing uh, dialogue, a proclamation of the Jesus as the Savior of the world. And then what? And then what? I just wanted to point out that in the Eastern churches, she does have an ongoing ministry in holy tradition um, that she was baptized as Fotini, and she carried on as an evangelist throughout the area and was eventually martyred, I think, in Rome. And her feast day is uh, February 26th. So we can't prove any of this uh, by Western standards, by, you know, historical outlinings. But there is a history that carries on that seamlessly, in my view, seamlessly ties into this amazing woman that we meet at a well and who, who stands before Jesus in a dialogue of, of theological import that rocks the world in a place of pregnant with all of the history of Israel and all of these characters. It's just amazing. So what can I say? Well, go now and do likewise. Be an evangelist. Proclaim Jesus. Amen.